3. Psalm 133. There's only three verses in this uh, psalm, and so we'll read all three verses. David here, inspired, writes, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garment. As the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. We talked about the dew of Hermon a couple of Wednesdays ago, and I thought I'd do a sermon kind of dealing with this idea. The psalm is about unity, and the unity that comes from being in fellowship with God. Being in fellowship with God required that David know the law of the Lord. And of course, as a psalmist, he wrote often about knowing the law of the Lord and loving the law of the Lord and desiring to hear the law of the Lord and uh, desiring to be in the place where the word of the Lord was spoken and preached. And the law of the Lord, the word of God, brings people together. In harmony, they have one standard, they have one Lord, and one God, and one faith, and that's basically what our study was about that Wednesday evening, about unity and being in fellowship, and how we are drawn together uh, by means of the Word of God to know what God would have us to do, and be in fellowship, not just with God, but with one another. Uh, the Bible, the New Testament, uh, tells us that that is a part of God's plan and a part of God's law. In 1 John 1, verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with God and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. We also note that in Psalm 119, 105, the word of God is referred to as a lamp, a light, a guide. And so John here writes about being in fellowship with God as a means by, or as a result of walking in light, walking in accordance with God's will, being in harmony with God. And not only then are we in fellowship with God, but we're in fellowship with everybody else who is in fellowship with God. And that unity is a true blessing, and the psalmist uh, understood that. He also understood what it was like to be, to have many enemies, enemies uh, of God who wanted to destroy David because he was a spokesman for God and a king over God's people. And how even from within, there were individuals uh, who would be against David when they were against God's word. And so... David uh, had a difficult life at times because of his uh, fellowship with God. There were individuals who did not like the word of God and the word of the law. Of course, sometimes the troubles were brought on David by his own actions when he separated himself from the law of God. So he understood both from personal experience what it was like, the hardships and the difficulties of not being united with God. And that made him uh, enjoy the unity that came from being with God a lot more. How much more pleasant it was to be on the Lord's side than against the Lord. He, uh, he saw the consequences of being against the Lord. It wasn't very pleasant, right? There are many examples uh, that David endured, and we could read all through the, uh, the Bible about examples of consequences of being against God and doing things that not in harmony with God. It wasn't pleasant. We might remember Lot's wife, as we are told to remember, right? Uh, it's not pleasant. And, of course, we could probably think in our own lives at times when we did things we shouldn't have and the consequences. It wasn't pleasant. But what was pleasant was dwelling together with brethren, individuals who with like mind, 1 Corinthians 1.10, in like judgment, were doing the same things, 
and being faithful to God and therefore being in fellowship with God and being in fellowship with one another. As 1 John 1, 7 tells us, uh, how pleasant it is, the psalmist says. And he, one of the examples of the pleasantness that he uses of being with God, that is knowing God's will, knowing God's law, and being, in fa and being faithful to it, the, the benefits, the pleasantry that comes from it, and the pleasantry it com that comes from being united based upon that one standard of God, he says it's like the dew, verse 3, of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. One blessing we read there in 1 John 1, the blessing of being with God and in fellowship with God is that the blood of Christ cleanses us from our sin, that we can have our sins forgiven, remitted, washed away as if we had never committed them simply by hearing the law of God and being faithful to it, obeying the word of God. And, of course, we are told that we have our sins washed away initially uh, after we have heard the word of God and we believe the word of God and we repent of our past sins and confess that Jesus is the Christ and we're baptized with him into his death. We're buried together with him into death. We rise up out of the watery grave of, of baptism, having our sins washed away, Revelation 1, verse 5. Our sins remitted, being forgiven, having our sins cleansed, having our lives cleansed. That's a true blessing from God that comes from God. The washing away of sins res uh, required our obedience to God, but how pleasant it is to obey God, to know that you can have your sins washed away. And I think that's the whole point here as we start to look at this idea of the dew of Hermon. Hermon was a mountain range or a mountain peak uh, there just north of Jerusalem. And it was very conspicuous. I think that's why it was, it was used a lot in the Bible. It was very conspicuous. It wasn't the tallest mountain. But there were a few things that happened on Mount Hermon, and my understanding is still happened today uh, from a weather standpoint. Uh, perhaps because of the climate there, maybe because of the, the, the winds, that, the way they, they blow over the mountain. Uh, and we, we understand that here in the mountainous areas of East Tennessee, the winds that blow over the mountain, um, how they cause uh, different tornadoes or, or cold fronts or whatever. And being close to the Mediterranean Sea, whatever it is scientifically, there were many times when the peak of Hermon was white. It was either snow or frost, but my understanding is that the dew of Hermon was, under, was well understood, and even today, that individuals who have camped out there, perhaps, uh, the dew of Hermon in the morning is, individuals have said that it's like it rained all night, and it didn't rain at all. And of course, that dew, we're told from uh, the very beginning, the book of Genesis and on, how God sent the dew to take care of his creation, right? To, to, to water the plants, to water the flowers. God takes care of his creation. And of course, man, uh, Psalm 8, is God's greatest creation, and he has provided everything uh, that we need in order to take care of ourselves. In fact, 75% of the planet's water or close to it, and almost that percentage of our body is made up of water, our brains have water in it, muscles. Our body needs water to survive. And so this idea of dew, when it really comes down to it, we see that it's part of life. Without water, we can't have life. And we even recognize that in water baptism, God used the mode of water to be that means by which we could have our sins washed away. Water is very important. And so we see that blessing of water not just uh, taking care of the, the plants and the fields and the flowers. And of course, in, Math, uh, of course in Matthew chapter 6, uh, the Bible, Jesus tells us if God takes care of all these plants and all these flowers and they're as beautiful as they can be, and they are, and you know, even, even in death, flat, uh, roses, or uh, not roses, but the leaves, we talked about the leaves falling, even in death they're beautiful. God's creation is just beautiful all the time, if we would give him the credit for it. But God takes care of his, of his creation, and if he, cre if he takes care of those creations, he takes care of, 
his greatest creation, man. So that, that Herman, whether it was white much of the year because of uh, frost or snow uh, or those dews, you know, I also, I don't know if this is scientifically related, but it reminds me of just different weather, weather patterns that cause these things. And of course, God created those weather patterns too. God is science. I mean, science, science doesn't exist without God's creation. But we, we hear of lake effect snow, like in near the Great Lakes, lake effect snow. We don't understand that down here. We don't see lake effect snow, but I've always, you know, when I was young, I was like, wow, lake effect snow, that would be cool. And you just get snow just because you're right there on the lake and it has to do with the winds blowing and the, the temperature. It's uh, those weather, whatever that weather pattern is that caused Herman to be well known and still well known for whatever, you know, the, the, the white peak or the water. But you think of when the snow melts and when that dew, uh, even though it hadn't rained, seeps into the ground and it seeps into the creeks and the creeks feed the rivers and the rivers flow down and everything from the top is blessed by those dew, by that dew. Even though it only uh, came, it came from the top, but it blessed everything on down. And when it got into the rivers and it kept flowing on down, it continued to bless as it went down the river. And we might see this as a picture of all blessings come from above, right? All, uh, James tells us that all good things come from God. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. You look at Mount Hermon and they saw the good and the blessings that came from above. And it truly is that our ability to have our sins washed away and to be saved from our past sins and all the physical blessings that the water and the dew and the, the refreshing nature that feeds the plants that we eat and that uh, that we need for water. And so the land was refreshed. The people that benefited from that land were refreshed. And so we talked that Wednesday night about how that kind of may have been the picture of the blessings that flowed and all the, the joy and the, the enrichment and the refreshing nature of the blessings that came from Hermon. And the comparison here, it seems to make sense because the psalmist says how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell in unity. And then he compares unity in God and unity with one another like the dew of Hermon. So it had to be something very, very uh, enriching and pleasant. Like the unity and the fellowship that we have today through obedience to God. 1 John 1, 6 through 10 as we just read a moment ago. In Psalm uh, 36 and we could go, there are many, many psalms that deal with this kind of concept, but we'll move on after this. Psalm 36, verse 9. But, uh, beginning in verse 5, and, and prior to this, the psalmist is talking about the difficulties of those who disobey God or fall away from God. In verse 5, the psalmist says, Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reacheth to the clouds. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. The judgments are a great deep, O Lord. Thou preservest man and beast. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings, they shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures, for with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. You know, there's a lot of refreshing uh, kind of ideas presented here. The mercy of the Lord is from above. There's nowhere we can go where God is not above or in the deep. And the Lord provides all the things that we need to provide our, to preserve man, whether it be physically or spiritually. And he talks about how excellent God is and his mercy and his love and his righteousness. Even the idea of being under the shadow of his wings, that's very refreshing too. Especially on a hot day, we generally go looking for a nice shade tree to hide ourselves from the beating of the sun. And sometimes there's a large difference between the temperature in the shade 
and the temperature outside the shade. So the idea of being refreshed and comforted by God, protected by God from the sun. You know, sometimes I th- uh, we have many examples we can think of. Uh, I think of all the country western songs I remember growing up to and how almost all of them had to do with water somewhere, right? some sort of cold water or clear water. And I would think of, you know, prior to a lot of the amenities that we have, like Yeti coolers and ice chests and bottled water and things like that, they may cowboy all day long in the hot sun, and it may be a long time before they come to a nice rolling brook or creek or river where they could uh, dip down and get some of that cool, refreshing water after that whole hard day of work and being in the sun, maybe jumping in and refreshing themselves. Uh, I think even out on the boat when we're fishing uh, on a hot sunny day, the sun's beating down and you're enjoying yourself, but it's hot and it can wear you down. You start that boat up and you splash a little water on you and you get that breeze on you. It feels like air conditioning and you're ready to go again, right? It's very refreshing. And so we can see all these things of being able to preserve ourselves, uh, that idea of water and cooling down and being refreshed from the sun. Verse 8 says, they shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. This means that God will provide all the things that we need so that we can be healthy and vibrant and energetic. All the things that we need, that that idea of fatness is we have all the things that we need to eat, to drink, to take care of ourselves, to be healthy. And then he says in verse 9, for with thee is the fountain of life. The fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. We could look at it and say, well, we need water to live and to be sustained. Those dew, the dew of Hermon, the, the rain water coming off of Hermon, the snow, the melting snow, it produced life all the way down, right, as it fed the plants and the vegetation and, of course, uh, provided a, a means for individuals to have drinking water and things like that. God provides us with a fountain of life that we can be spiritually alive. In Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 2, Jeremiah, we many times refer to him as the weeping prophet. (laughs) He wrote the book of Lamentations. He saw a lot of evil in his day, and he was treated and persecuted for being faithful to God. But even he saw this concept of being refreshed, and it all had to be, it all, his refreshing didn't come from mankind because man persecuted him for being with God. In Jeremiah 2, verse 13, being a prophet who was bringing forth a message to the people that wasn't very pleasant, he was letting them know the consequences of their actions, and that was not going to be pleasant. But he did inform them that they could be blessed, and they could be refreshed, and they could have pleasantry if they were to repent and come back to God. But God says through Jeremiah, chapter 2, verse 13, My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me the fountain of living waters. They forsake it. So when you forsake God, you've forsaken the fountain of living waters and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that hold no water. Now without water you die. (laughs) And so these individuals had rejected the life-giving water that was necessary to survive spiritually. It was God. God referred to himself here as the fountain of living waters. They rejected the life-giving waters of God, and of course that is his word, his law, our obedience to it, our unity with it is very pleasant and refreshing as we read in Psalm 133. But what did they do? They replaced that wonderful water with cisterns, man-made places of water, 
that were broken and held no water. If God is the fountain of life and if God is the fountain of living waters, if we want spiritual life, we have to go to the source. And we look above, right, for the source. And like they looked to Mount Hermon, they could see the mountain peak of Mount Hermon. But they rejected the life-giving waters of God and they, they chose their own way. They chose their own source of water. Broken cisterns, man-made ways, man-made thoughts which hold no water, which leads to spiritual death, right? Because they could not live without the living waters. In Amos chapter 8, Amos prophesied of the destruction of Israel Amos was, is sometimes referred to as the country prophet. So it makes sense that he would talk about water and rivers and fruit and vegetation. We drop down to verse uh, 11 of Amos chapter 8, and he's prophesying to the people, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. And of course they understood a famine, we read of famines going back through the book uh, of Genesis. One of the big famous famines was that which brought Joseph and his family back together. He says, I will send a famine in the land. But notice this wasn't a famine of physical food and physical water, which are necessary for life. He says, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. There will be a famine of of the word of God. Now if there's a famine of the word of God, people die. We understand if there's a famine of bread, a famine of water, you can't live without sustenance and nutrition and water and food, you die. And so if there's a famine of word of God, people reject God's word, there's no nourishment, there's no nutrition, there's no uh, re being refreshed. Now why would God allow that to take place? because they had rejected it already. God said, I will send it. In essence, though, he was saying, I'm just going to let it continue. You've already, you've already been living as if there was no word of God. And, of course, we know that there was a period of time where God didn't speak any new revelation. We call that in between the Testaments, right? The time between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the New Testament starts and we start to hear word of God again, right, in the first century. And so uh, this prophecy that there would, there would be no word of God. Well, they had word of God, but they had rejected it. When you reject it, it's as if you don't have it at all. Verse 12, it says, They shall wander from sea to sea, from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and they shall not find it. In other words, there was not going to be any new revelation from that point to the next. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. Well, if we don't have water, eventually we'll pass out. I've been in a situation where it was hot and we'd been out uh, waiting to hear a speaker. A speaker was late. It was hot, it took for a long period of time, and I was working in news at the time to cover the event. And people started to faint, pass out, because they didn't have water and it was hot. People were picking them up and passing them from the middle of the crowd over to where EMS personnel could take care of them. They started to hand out bottled water. The bottled water was hot. It was just water. And I drank that water because I knew if I don't drink water, I'm going to be next. I'm not going to pass out. It was nasty. It was horrible. It was hard to drink. You know, sometimes even uh, something that don't taste good can refresh your body. I needed that water, but I didn't want it. 
and it didn't taste good, and it was horrible. I had to force myself to drink that water. Um, it had been sitting out in the sun all day, but I didn't want to pass out. And by the end of the day, I was not feeling good. <laughs> but I kept drinking that warm water, almost hot water. These people were drinking what they wanted to drink, right? They weren't looking for word of God. They were finding something else. And you remember in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, uh, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. They shall be filled. Well, they'll be filled with what? They'll be filled with the refreshing nature of word of God that brings about salvation for the soul and nutrition to keep you spiritually alive. Amos is talking about his being a prophet of God. They're, gonna, they're already eating and drinking whatever they want. They're unhealthy, spiritually speaking. And for that reason, God didn't see any need to give them any new words. They weren't listening to the ones he'd already given them. There was a famine in the land, a famine of word of God. There's a famine in the world today of word of God. You can go to any dollar store and pick up a Bible. So the, the word of God is here. It's prevalent. The, the, if people will hunger and thirst after righteousness, they can find it. But the famine is that they don't go looking for the word of God. They don't hunger and thirst after righteousness. They hunger and thirst after things that can fill their own belly. In Jude 12, and we'll wrap up here and maybe I'll make this a two-parter. I haven't done that in a while. Jude 12. You'll remember, well, Jude begins by uh, verse 3 saying, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. All right? But he says... There's a, there's a problem. We have false teachers who are causing individuals or preaching words that men were eating and drinking that was causing them to be lost. And notice in verse 12, Jude writes by inspiration, These are spots in your feasts of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit wherewith without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved for the blackness of darkness forever. Spots. These were problem spots, right? They were flaws. They, they were imperfections. There were feasts that were ordained by God, commanded by God, that we read about in the, in the Old Testament. And then there were feasts that individuals did voluntarily that was not commanded, and there was nothing wrong with them because they didn't break any law. And I think the feast here, some of these feasts, were referencing some of those voluntary feasts. That these individuals would come together and would enjoy unity, right? The pleasantry of unity. But he said in the midst of these feasts, as these feasts were ending, your feasts of love, your feast with you, there were individuals who were feeding themselves. And of course, they may have started their own feasts, which would have been anti-God, and which would have been drawing individuals away from morality and righteousness towards ungodliness and lasciviousness, taking people away from the spiritual side to the more uh, the filth of the flesh side, feeding themselves without fear. And so these feasts were to be, uh, were supposed to be after the, the, the idea of the feast that God had presented to be in unity with God and others, but some might have been there to feed upon them and to start their own feast in which they were hungering and thirsting after immorality. 
But notice it said they were clouds without water. So they offered something that they didn't have because when we think of these feasts, we think of unity and fellowship and love and joy. That's not what they were joining people together. That's not what they were offering. And the clouds, we see the clouds and we think of the rain that comes from the clouds that refreshes the earth and uh, nourishes the vegetation so that we can have things that we need. But they were without water. And then he goes on to explain how they were trees that fruit withereth and without fruit and twice dead plucked up by the roots. These were individuals, obviously, that were drawing people away from righteousness as opposed to bringing people together. They looked like the things that would bring refreshment and nourishment, but ultimately they brought spiritual death. And when people followed after that, when they hungered and thirsted after the worldliness and the immorality and the ungodliness, they basically were as dead as the ones who were, all, as what the individuals who were preaching were offering them. Clouds without water, worthless, no, no nourishment at all. Feasts that were not of love and not after God. Feasts that were feeding the worst impulses of man. And trees that brought forth no fruit and sometimes dead fruit, twice dead fruit. Verse 13 goes into the idea of raging waves. This is a dangerous place to be. <laughs> this is not a good, safe place to be. It's not like the shade of the wings of God or the shade of the tree. And so the pleasantness, the, the nourishment that God provides, some individuals try to steal and take away. And if we have a famine of those things because we draw ourselves towards other things other than the word of God, we, we steal the life-giving water or nourishment that comes from God, and we might say the top of Mount Hermon, the dew of Hermon, we steal that blessing away from ourselves when we don't hunger and thirst after righteousness and hunger and thirst after what God has provided, the, the food, the nutrition, the water, the living waters of life that flow from God and flow from above. I think we'll end there and we'll come back to that next Sunday, Lord willing. But the beautiful picture of unity and refreshment that comes from God in hearing his word and obeying it as opposed to the dark, deadly, dangerous, unpleasant, situation where we separate ourselves from the living waters and join ourselves to the broken cisterns that have no water, the clouds that hold no water. And so we see here the enjoyment and the refreshment and the pleasantry that comes from being with God. And that's, uh, that's the, the point of all of this. And we'll continue uh, next Sunday. I've already introduced the invitation. Individuals who hear the word of God and believe it can act upon it. Ultimately, being baptized in water puts you in fellowship with God. God adds those individuals to his church. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 through verse 47, where we live a life connected to God, connected to the vine, John 15, which brings us nutrition and, and wholesome uh, food and, and spiritual nutrition. But we are to be faithful unto death, Revelation 2, verse 15. And when we are faithful to death, we will enjoy the blessing and the reward of being faithful to God. And ultimately, that's why we're here today. And if we can in, in, uh, implore you to be with us and to hear the word of God, we encourage you to do that. If there's anybody here who has separated themselves from that enrichment and that uh, refreshment of God and have gone out into the dried wilderness uh, we invite you to come home. If we can stand and sing this song and encourage you to uh, allow us to help you if you need. There is a... Praise this for me.
opportunity to return to the Lord a portion of those things he's given us, and we will do that at this time. I ask you to bow, please. Holy Father in heaven, we're thankful for the day you've given us. We're thankful now for the opportunity that we have to return back to you a portion of those things you've blessed us with. We pray that we would do this as we purpose in our heart and we would be cheerful in our giving back to you. We ask you to be with us here to help us to be wise in the decisions that we make that much good could come from the efforts we put forth in this place and other places as well to spread your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.